Welcome to Political Pulse, where we delve into the ever-changing social landscape with the leading minds shaping policy today. We are your hosts. I'm Nikki Jenkins, and I'm with Xavier Balnaves. Today, we're joined by Michael Sheldrick, co-founder of Global Citizen, an action platform dedicated to ending poverty and improving the environment. Michael has collaborated with prominent world leaders, artists, and philanthropists to advance sustainable development goals within countries. His efforts have helped raise over 48 billion US dollars in poverty support and provided life-changing assistance to over 1 billion people worldwide. Michael's impact demonstrates that we all have a role to play in improving living conditions globally and holding governments accountable. Michael, thank you for joining us joining us today on Political Pulse. We deeply appreciate your time that uh, you've taken to speak with us. It's truly incredible. Uh, let's get into the questions. Um, so, Michael, you've successfully combined law, political science, and international relations with impactful activism. Can you trace back to what catalyzed your commitment in global advocacy, perhaps due to your academic background and studies in UWA? Yeah, well, first off, it's real great pleasure to be with you here. Um, it's great to be here at Scotch College, and so thank you for having me as a, as a guest on, on your podcast. Um, you know, I think when I got into UWA, I, I didn't necessarily knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something that was about extending equality of opportunity to people around the world. I was always grateful for the education opportunities I had grown up here in Western Australia, and I wanted to give back. And I was acutely aware that there were millions of people around the world, children in particular, who they may not have access to great teachers, they may not have access to a great school, they may not even have access to something as simple as a 13 cent vaccine, which meant that they would die before they had even reached their fifth birthday, let alone get into school. But I knew I, I wanted to do something to help address these, these inequities. And so when I first got into university, I did um, a lot of fundraising, right? So I was very good at asking people to give away stuff for free. So I went to the shopping mall, asked for vouchers, asked for things to, to give away. And people gave me vouchers, they gave me small gifts. And what I did is I did a quiz night. That was the first thing I ever did. We raised about $1,000 to build a school in Papua New Guinea and Timor-Leste. But as we did more of that and was raising these funds, we realized, wow, looking at how many kids are out of school around the world, that's gonna take a lot of charity night gala dinners in order to raise the billions to end extreme poverty. And, and, and the truth is you can't do that, right? There's no amount of gala night charity dinners that you can raise to raise the billions to end extreme poverty. And so that's where we, we realized it's gonna take a social movement. Structural issues, systemic issues require systemic solutions. You can see that throughout history, the civil rights movement in the US, the end of apartheid in South Africa, the end of the transatlantic slave trade. All of these were brought about by social movements. And so we got together looking in the 21st century, how do you do that? The power of popular culture, musicians, also the power of social media, how you could leverage us to bring about social change and to get these issues on the radar of governments, businesses and, and foundations. Yeah, even with speaking to, you've spoken to Beyonce, you've spoken to a <laughs> range of artists, uh, philanthropists, and um, even government officials. And that sort of brings us on to a next question with sort of your individual um, change, I guess, in encouraging others to change and contributing. It's all about volunteering and the constant cycle of volunteering, which is required um in essence for people to be able to make good change in the world um, and you're a great advocate for volunteering um, doing volunteering yourself and encouraging to others others to volunteer and um, you're a finalist for the young commonwealth person of the year in 2017 and what do you think of the most underappreciated aspects of volunteer vol volunteerism and driving social change yeah, look, I, I recently had the opportunity to write a book to try and distill my learnings in co-founding Global Citizen. Um, and it's called From Ideas to Impact, playbook for how to influence and implement policy in a divided world. And one of the things I talk about is the fact that there are many ways you can volunteer your time to make a difference, right? 
you can volunteer to fundraise like I did. You can even go to communities and volunteer your time. Um, in certain parts of the world, even registering to vote. I mean, here in Australia, we have compulsory voting, but even getting people out to, to exercise their right to vote is, is one way you can volunteer their time. You can even have conversations around the dinner table, right? And I don't think we should underestimate the importance of that right now. When people look at media, they look online, they don't know what to trust, they don't know what's real. One of the best sources of information is actually around the dinner table with friends and family. And if you take the US, I'm sure Sure more people here talk about climate change but in the US only 8% of American households even talk about climate change every year but but one avenue that we don't tend to talk as much about is policy change right and that's because policy can sound abstract and vague but at the end of the day policy is fundamentally about people right policy when it works it can improve people's lives and it's also about the people who shape policy and I believe whether you're a cultural icon like Beyonce or Taylor Swift or a business leader or an everyday citizen, there's a role that we can all play in bringing about policy change. And so in my book, I try and identify eight ways that we can all play to contribute our time to bring about the biggest policy changes the world needs, whether that's making sure artificial intelligence works for everyone and not just those who can afford access um, or the, the great challenge of climate change which of course impacts all of society and in myriad different ways there's something for us all, all to do and when you talk about that policy change is that mainly adhering to audiences and societies and people are part of that to make sure that they're heard yeah i i think that's right like increasingly at global citizen i mean we used to call ourselves a movement, right? We have 12 million advocates around the world, but increasingly we've become far more of a platform. And, you know, I've worked with communities around the world, communities in vulnerable situations, but whether it's a leader of a community um, from a small island nation on the front lines of climate change, whether it's, um, I've worked with um, young women in South Africa campaigning for an end to period poverty and making sure that sanitary pads and napkins are available to girls in school. You know, I, I, I see myself increasingly as a, as a platform to be leveraged what we've built to help communities amplify what they need, amplify their asks, and to make sure in the corridors of power around the world, those asks are heard and, and responded to. Because at the end of the day, you know, we can sit in our ivory tower, we can talk about how bad the world is, but really to influence power, we've got to go to where power resides and bring those voices in. And I think increasingly Global Citizen and other platforms have a responsibility to do that and make sure those voices are in, in those corridors. And with having that power, especially as Chief Policy Impact and Government Affairs Officer, how do you prioritize issues and campaigns, especially considering the vast array of global challenges around the world? Yeah, no, it's it's a great it's a great question. And in, in my book, I talk about how to identify good goals, right? Because I would get people rocking up to me and there's no shortage of people in the world diagnosing problems. We can all do that. Illegal deforestation, plastic in the ocean. In many cases, people have already mobilized money to launch a campaign on these issues. But unless we know where we're heading, our true north, you know, we're just raising awareness about a problem. And so at Global Citizen, we often talk about our true north being the end of extreme poverty, right? Contributing to a world without extreme poverty, that's our focus. So everything we do, whether it's climate change, whether it's access to water and sanitation, whether it's access to education, we always bring it back to whether or not it's contributing to our mission of, of ending extreme poverty. But for groups around the world, you know, I, I often advise them if they're looking for how to come up with a meaningful goal to uh, address a challenge, you know, what are you working on that is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound? You know, and I, I certainly believe that a well crafted goal, you know, a friend of mine talks about the concept of naively audacious goals. If you have a well crafted goal, right, that is very clear that if it's implemented, the impact it could have on people's lives, that can act as a magnet to mobilize people and it can overcome barriers such as access to power, access to funds, in order to mobilize people around the biggest challenges of our time. Yeah, and um, all of those challenges, as you've talked about, are 
can be sort of aided by the sort of help of individual global citizens across the world by rallying together and, as you said before, striking power where it is, where it actually resides, instead of um, brushing around the bush and uh, making uninfluential decisions. Um, When we're talking about extreme poverty, especially in areas which have been previously colonised, um, what uh, a lot of sort of research with decolonization it pushes towards giving back control of culture to the people that actually reside in these countries. How does global citizen work to help these people um, take back control over education, their finances from sort of oppressive governance? I think it's a good question. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to to talk to and meet with and work with for the last about almost two years, 18 months, two years, um, the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley. She's an incredible human being. She's, I think, one of the most inspiring leaders on the planet right now. Although Barbados is just a country of 300,000 people, she's a leader that punches above her weight. She's the first female Prime Minister of her country. She won a landslide election in 2018. She was re-elected in 2022. Um, and really, you know, what she's done is she's come up with a sweep of policies, right, to unlock the funding needed to help countries like hers actually adapt to clean energy and be able to withstand natural disasters. Because many of these countries, you talk about the legacy of, of colonialism, you look at Barbados, Barbados was actually the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, right? And she would argue that the proceeds that the British Empire got from her country in part helped fund the Industrial Revolution, which in turn, of course, contributed to the emissions in the planet um, that has resulted in the climate change her country is, is facing right now. So she would often say, wow, we're hit by a double whammy. We had the legacy of colonialism and slavery, and now we're dealing with climate change as a result. But what she's done is, you know, she's also a realist. She knows that if you go to London, you go to Washington, you just go and ask for money, no one's going to hear you. So she's come up with a way for the biggest banks in the world and others to provide affordable loans, right, at low interest that's affordable, you know, uh, that could help her country and others adapt to clean energy. And, And this is important for all of us, right? At the end of the day, right, we know if we're to address climate change, right, this needs to be the whole world getting behind it, right? If only half of the world um, contributes to ending climate change, the planet's still gonna burn. But we also need to offer communities, you know, it can't be going to communities in India or in parts of Africa and saying, you know, we need you to stop developing because otherwise the planet's gonna burn because they're rightly gonna say, well, hold on a sec, this is a bit hypocritical you guys developed and lifted your communities out of poverty and you're saying we can't lift our communities out of poverty so we've got to find a way in which action on climate change doesn't come across as saying to communities you need to stay in poverty as well so we need to find new pathways and one way to do that is to make sure these communities actually have access to the money they need in order to invest in renewable energy and i i spend a lot of time working with young people Um, on the continent of Africa and they always say to me that you know the way they look at climate action is part of the broader societal transformation that needs to take place um, to meet their aspirations to meet their dreams to meet their their goals and objectives yeah and your experiences has seen you effectively bridging the gap between the world of pop culture as you mentioned you met with a lot of artists such as Beyonce and Coldplay and also um, bridging the world of the intricate realm of global policy and engaging with some of the biggest names in entertainment as well as political figures across the political spectrum. In uniting these distinct spheres towards shared humanitarian goals what strategies do you employ to align the influence of celebrities and the pragmatic objectives of political leaders? Yeah, so I think, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to work with these incredible artists, as you say, who give so much time and attention. And one of the things these artists are acutely aware of is, you know, what they can do 
beyond just asking their, f- their fans to donate money, right? And there's, there's a lot that they can do in order to get their fans engaged. And we often talk about the idea of pop and policy, right? That's our modus operandi at Global Citizen. So we leverage the power of popular culture to mainstream these issues and give people a way to take action and contribute. But I just want to use one example. You know, I know Coldplay were recently in Perth, I think, three yeah, or four months yeah. ago. And around November. Yeah, around November. Uh, those that went had a great time. Like, it was amazing. So we've been the official charity partner of Coldplay, um, and Chris Martin's been our official curator since 2015, right? And there's a number of ways that they've been contributing. The first is, you know, in order to have credibility, you've got to make sure your own house is in order first, right? And there was this interview in 2019 Chris was doing an interview on the BBC. He had his manager sat next to him and he said, we're not going to tour again until we can do so in the most sustainable way possible. And his manager looked at him being like, are you crazy? <laughs> like, this is hundreds of millions of dollars a year for our tour. And so, you know, you had the pandemic, right? And through that period, they were looking at ways through which they could reduce their carbon footprint of their tour. And not just like in the past, businesses had offsets. So you purchase carbon credits and you might say, oh, I'm planting trees over here to offset the emissions from my tour. These days, that you can't really do that anymore because it's really just seen as pain to pollute, right? You're outsourcing the problem. So Coldplay had this goal. They said, how can we reduce our carbon footprint from our tour by up to 50%? Because why 50%? Because the Paris Agreement on Climate Change asks humanity to reduce our global emissions in half by 2030. And I think they looked at really practical ways. So if you had friends or families that was at the Coldplay tour, you would know that the the, the dance floor in the center developed kinetic energy and that kinetic that powered energy the yeah, powered yeah, it. Yeah. They had solar panels. Yeah, exactly, right? And then they told that story and I think they reduced their carbon footprint by 47%, right? So great. And what that does is that sends a message to others. Well, this is how you do it. This is how you have a a sustainable carbon footprint. But the other powerful thing is how you use your your voice. And Xavier, this goes back to the question you asked earlier. How do you use it to lift up communities? And I remember in 2021, we um, were contacted by some indigenous organizations in the Amazon. Many people don't know this, but although indigenous people make up 5% of the world's population. They're responsible for protecting over 50% of the world's rainforests and biodiversity. And these indigenous groups said, hey, we've contacted all these governors across all of these states in Brazil to ask them to protect the Amazon. Because at the time, the Amazon was burning. There was a lot of illegal deforestation. And they asked Coldplay, they said, listen, we haven't got a response from our governors. Will you amplify our asks? So Coldplay put on their Twitter and they go to all these governors say, hey, why haven't you replied to these groups and these letters? And of course, you know, these governors getting lots of messages from Coldplay fans, they reply, right? And they say, oh, yeah, okay, sorry about that. And one governor alone replied to these indigenous groups' demands and said that he would protect an area in the Amazon that is equivalent to the size of the state of Rhode Island in the US. And it was the only new area of Amazon protected in the four years under the previous government in the Amazon. And now there's a lot of follow up as well. But that's one example of how artists, popular culture can leverage their platform to lift up the asks and demands from um, not just indigenous groups, but other communities in vulnerable situations. Yeah, and as someone who went to the Coldplay concert themselves, <laughs> um, um, it was incredible to see th- how well Chris Martin and his team actually utilized uh, their platform, their power even, um, to sort of leverage their fans and other people into advocating and understanding the issues and, you know, what exactly they're supporting and what they're changing with their carbon footprint. So I think I think it was really cool. And, um, and hopefully we're, we're hoping Taylor Swift might see that and yeah. emulate it as well. And then that would be really yeah, powerful. Then yeah. you, have, then you ha- yeah. truly have the le- leverage and impact. Mm-hmm. Um, following up off that, how do you navigate the inherent complexity of, of fostering cross-partisan alliances and ensuring these diverse collaborations are effective? You know, I I, I mentioned earlier, right, like, and I talk about this in the book, I I talk about pop and policy and, you know, I talk about how to engage politicians, but I think you have to recognize at the end of the day, you know, 
there's a self-interest in everything, right? Politicians, whether we like it or not, the nature of our system is they, they want to be elected. They, they want to feel good. So it's like, as a platform, how can you function both as a carrot and as a stick, right? We can hold um, leaders accountable for the promises they've made. We can mobilize citizens, but we can always also say like, listen, if you do the right thing, you'll be applauded. And I, I'll never forget one of the very first leaders I had the opportunity to meet was Julia Gillard when she was prime minister. And she was, a, she was a phenomenal leader and I have a lot of respect for her. And I still remember I met her for the first time here in Perth. Um, when she was prime minister, I had 10 minutes with her. I was sat opposite. I was probably not that much older than you guys. And I was really nervous. And um, she, pa she paused and she said, Michael, I'm on my third shot of Red Bull for the evening. So if you don't mind, let's, let's get on with it. So we go in the conversation and I pitch her on the idea that we want her um, to contribute to. And at the end of this, she pauses and she says, um, I love the idea. I want to support it, but I need help. And I thought, well, what do you mean? You're like the most powerful person in the country. <laughs> what can I possibly do? I'm just a uni student. What can I do to help? And she said something that's always stuck with me. She essentially said, you know, I need permission to spend what is in the end your money, right? She needed a public mandate. And um, I don't know where that came from in terms of my response. All I remember is pitching her on a concert. I said, what about if we did a concert? You know, we mobilize all these young people, we get them together, we'll show how much people, in, in this case, we were campaigning on the issue of polio eradication, a particular disease that we we're trying to raise money for. And she said, um, well, if you can do that, we've got a deal. Uh, six months later, um, you know, there we were, and she was making this big commitment. And I said, wow, I kept my word, you kept your word, and more, more to the point, here we are changing the world. And, you know, that, that journey I talk about in the book, but we convinced John Legend to fly all the way over here. But I think you've got to, you got to recognize the constraints. And as much as we would like, you know, even our politicians can't just click their fingers and hope for things to happen, you know? And so I always think, well, how can I help them to help us? And I think that's the question that those of us in the social impact advocacy space need to be asking ourselves a lot more. And it sort of alludes to the idea that, you know, it's, it's something about not someone having more power than one another, but it's about work together to, to stimulate exactly. how that power creates that change. Yeah. And, and was that the same event where you raised 118 million dollars. That was for. that was that, that was, is amazing. Um, it was it was 2011. Uh, it was a gathering of Commonwealth leaders here in Australia. You had everyone like David Cameron at the time, Prime Minister of Canada. You know, all hosted by Julie Gillard, um, and we had all of these amazing artists that flew in. But it was also where we came up with the innovation for Global Citizen because we were wondering how we was going to get people along. And I had no idea if people would pay to see John Legend. I didn't know that. So we came up with this platform. Um, someone suggested it to us in America, this Californian guy, Ryan Gore. And he said, why don't you, rather than charging for tickets, give away the tickets, ask people to sign a petition. And in signing the petition, you go in the draw to earn a ticket. So we had 25,000 people sign this petition. Um, for 5,000 tickets and we presented that petition to Julia Gillard and so that's where the idea of we called it gamified activism and literally after that event here in Perth nine months after that we were standing on the Great Lawn of Central Park um, for what was the first Global Citizen Festival with 60,000 people all of whom took action to get in um, and from that the rest was history now we have over 33 million citizen actions helped to lead $40 billion in money being dispersed to touch the lives of a billion people. Yeah, and as you were talking about before with how we've got this pop and politics concept where popular culture actually feeds into how people perceive and act on politics, um, it's a large part of how, well, we as young people engage in politics is how, um, our, how we see popular culture and how that influences our uh, influence us voting um onto this like with the media uh, in a world where media is changing rapidly with ai and misinformation how does um global citizen uh help uh sort of i guess um create media and create platforms that are free of these uh, uh free of um 
these sorts of uh, uh, misinformation. Yeah, you know, and I, I think I, I can sort of see where you're going with this. And, you know, I've got to say, it's, it's amazing chatting to you guys. And it was really cool this morning speaking to some of the some of the classes here at Scotch College and seeing the energy and excitement. But one thing I, I often say about platforms such as mine or even artists, we have a responsibility in what we share. And I think right now, because the world is in crisis, there's that temptation to like post about how, how bad the world is. And I was part of this study at New York University in, in America, and they, they surveyed 60 countries, 60,000 people, including um, Australia. And what it found is if you want people to repost things on social media and share, go for your life, right? Post how bad the world is, climate change is happening, doom and gloom, and that will get you the best engagement. But what it also showed is there was a negative um, consequence of that. And those same people who were sharing, it was also likely to, to lead to a loss of belief in their ability to influence policy change, right? I, I don't know why, maybe it's because it's, it leads into beliefs of um, defeatism, fatalism, you know, the idea that everything's already baked in, there's nothing we can do. And I think for us as as at Global Citizen, what we try and do is we always try and prioritize impact over ideology. We always try and put solutions to the core. And I think right now what we see is actually um, a craving for solutions. You know, I think there is a real desire for people to see well, what, what can be addressed. And the good news is there's actually a lot of great examples of people contributing at local, state, federal, global level. We just need to bring those stories to the fore. And I think pr platforms like us and artists, etc., have a responsibility to share those stories and to provide those solutions, right? And one thing one thing that I, I have seen again and again is... Um, you know, yes, yes, there's a lot of stuff on social media, but often where that comes from that I've seen is when people have anxiety, when they have outrage over a crisis and they don't know how they can contribute to the solution, that's where other maybe sometimes unhelpful distractions come up. You know, you can tend to start policing other people's accounts. You know, did you post this? Did you do that? And I think the way you get around it is by giving them alternatives. Here's something constructive you can do. And this is what I this is what I talk about in the book in terms of how we how we can do something about it. And even something as simple, by the way, like if you're an artist and you're sharing an action and you want your fans to do something, rather than posting like a piece of content which is telling you how bad the world is, you know, one of the most effective actions was actually encouraging people to sit down and challenging themselves to write a letter to a child who may not even be born today, but a child who will be an adult in the year 2055 and basically outlining to them all of the things you, you, you did to mitigate the climate crisis and challenge yourself to write this letter. Maybe you have to do a little bit of research, but to write this letter to say, here are all the things I can do. And the act of writing that letter research what that showed is that that had a positive impact on people's beliefs that they could contribute to to policy change. So there's 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 a lot we can do, but it starts with those of us with platforms, including you know you guys have this platform with this podcast in terms of the messaging we're we're sharing. You know, there's, there's that great adage as well, like sharing other stories of success. You know, you can convince people that we can make a difference by showing them that we we have made a difference. Especially because I feel like nowadays a lot of people do get lost in that idea of there's so so many problems, so much to do, so much to fix. But, exactly. You know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. The little things. Ex yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but lastly, uh, Michael, reflecting on your journey from a university student in Australia to a global advocate for change. What personal lessons do, have you learned about leadership and making a difference? And what advice would you give to the world of young individuals who are passionate about making a positive impact? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think building on the last question, you know, as hard as it is, you know, resisting the, the temptation, you know, one of my friends talks about the desire um, to to go go for things that make that validate our desire to feel um, right, righteous, certain and safe, right? And um, to look for things that validate our view of the world. I think as much as possible, 
have conversations, engage with those we disagree with. Because at the end of the day, change is usually brought about when you look at all of the Ming and For um, progress in the world. Change is usually brought about by agreements between different parties, different sides, in which no side gets everything they want, right? But it's coming together and saying, we're going to agree for the sake of this project, we're going to move forward. Um, in, in the book, I, I talk about the Good Friday peace agreement in Northern Ireland, which is now over 25 years old. And I talk about, you know, in the 70s and 80s, it was all of this great violence in the troubles in, in Northern Ireland. Thousands of people died. When they did that agreement, you know, either side, you know, didn't get everything they want. In fact, one of the harshest things was they were negotiating prisoner swaps and that was, or prisoner releases. And that was in, in, insanely hard because you literally had people being released who to the other side, they saw as murderers. They said, you killed my family members, you killed my friends. And yet they were able to come to this agreement on this basis. And look, there's still tension in Northern Ireland, but you look at it today, many people, many people will look at that and say, well, people forget everything we went to, but ultimately what matters is that it was done. And I managed to interview some of the diplomats involved. And he said, what, what, how they got that agreement done was the diplomats basically having courage to go against the grain with from their own side they weren't afraid about what the other side would call them but they were worried about their own tribe if you like accusing them of being a traitor accusing them of 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 treachery accusing them of betrayal right and it was the courage of those involved to go against the grain and so I think that's that's one point is just to recognize that it's okay if you don't get everything all at once. That pragmatism is essential. And I've seen this again and again. And when you can get two sides together um, that can agree on certain things, that's where the magic happens. That's where change happens. I think the second point I would say is um, don't don't worry about the journey. If you know your goal, if you know your cause, focus on that and try and try and reduce it to a little bite-sized um, win that you can do right um, try and focus on maybe it's even having a meeting with someone maybe it's just getting a response but try and break down that goal into bite-sized pieces because if you can if you can win on even one small thing right and literally maybe it is just having someone agree to meet with you again or to consider they may not even agree to everything but the act of doing that and then you share that story with others and say hey look we're, we're getting some momentum here we're getting traction that will inspire other people to get behind you everyone loves to back a winning horse everyone loves to back a train that's leaving the station and so i often tell people i quote one of my heroes um, is Eleanor Roosevelt, former first lady of the US, who was also the first US ambassador to the UN. She wrote the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, you know, she has this wonderful saying, and when I moved to America, I have this uh, saying on, uh, found this on a magnet, which I still have in my fridge. And she said, um, the best way to begin is to begin. And so there's each of us, there's something each of us can do. All we have to do is get started. Yeah, well, thank you for telling us all of these different things on Global Citizen and how you've sort of done this massively great impact for the world. And um, I look forward to our listeners and uh, people at our school and youth uh, in Western Australia definitely engaging in being a global citizen and lending their individual time and changing habits to um, fit into like a changing world of values where we can be more environmentally sustainable and help others. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Of course, Keep up the good work. It's been great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank being you. here today, Thank Michael. You.